Greetings, great people. My name is Dr. Scholar Lee. Welcome to the Gender Docu-Series. This docu-series was created to educate, elevate, and empower society to evolve when it comes to affirming the identities of the transgender non-conforming community. I also created this docu-series in the memory of the transgender non-conforming individuals who have lost their lives. If you are interested in interviewing and or sponsoring this docu-series, please send me an email. My contact information is above. And with that being said, great people continue to be great. Be be bold and always, always be you. Enjoy the interview. Peace. Hey, y'all. J Mimes, I use they, them, and she, her pronouns. I am based in the beautiful city of New York, uh, specifically in Brooklyn. Um, this is where I was born and raised. Uh, still have a lot of family members out here. Um, on the day to day, I work in marketing at a trans telehealth company. Uh, but outside of my role as a marketer, I consider myself to be a facilitator, an organizer, a healer. Uh, someone who is deeply spiritual and connected to the divine, uh, and most importantly, a, a comrade uh, and a friend in my communities. Well, okay, okay. <laughs> we got a lot in common already. I love it. Um, so, Jay, um, tell us about yourself. Tell us, tell us about yourself. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Where do I begin? Um, <laughs> I truly don't know where to start. <laughs> well, how about this? So tell us what is it like navigating this, uh, I was about to say navigating the streets of Brooklyn, right? But that's pretty much what I was gonna ask. So what is it like, uh, you know, living in Brooklyn as a gender neutral being? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is, it's, it's an interesting duality, I think to exist in, in most urban like cities in America. Right, because on the one hand, you are, if you're queer identifying, if you are black or brown, you can generally walk a block or two and see someone who looks like you. Um, but my experience as a trans non-binary person, especially someone who is AMAB, assigned male, male at birth and considers myself to be trans feminine, um, it can be weird. There are moments where I simultaneously feel really empowered and emboldened and in my shit walking around. Uh, and there are other moments where I feel endangered, where I feel like I'm a spectacle, where I feel like I'm being watched uh, and not really being respected. Um, that, of course, is like shifted during the pandemic. So I've been transitioning now for close to four years um, in a public way. And of course, that coincides with several years of the pandemic we are still in. Uh, thankfully, I've had a lot of support systems, right? So my family, while they haven't been the biggest LGBTQ champions, have not disowned me. Uh, they have not made me feel as though I don't belong. Um, and I have a partner who has continued to hold me down and we've been together now for over seven years. Um, so that's through my transition uh, and ongoing, right? Um, but thankfully, I have that bubble, right, to, to return to and to feel safe in. Um, but I'd be lying if I said that there weren't days where internally I'm like, who am I? Am I pretending? You know, there's so much of, um, there's so much of a normative pressure on all of us, whether we, uh, uh, aspire to exist in the binary, right? And that's what feels best to us in our identities, or if we want to exist outside of it, which is the case for me. Um, so I would say that there are some days where it's really, really rough, but, for the most part, I think I'm in a, I'm in a really, honestly, I'm in the best place of my life, you know, mm -hmm. mentally, emotionally and spiritually. I never thought that I could feel this good about myself, if I'm mm -hmm. being honest. And that's something that I really, I hold with me and I, I practice a lot of gratitude and mindfulness around is to think about how I used to think I didn't deserve anything. How I used to think that happiness, contentedness, safety, security, there were concepts that were not really for me almost purely because I existed in a black body. So not even thinking about the gendered elements uh, around it. Um, and to not have that be the case for me on the day to day anymore is incredible. It's a blessing, 
Mm, I love that. I love that. Um, first of all, round of applause to your partner and your uh, family for the support, because those are some of the main obstacles and challenges that we face as gender minorities, gender variant, I don't like using minorities, but gender variant beings, uh, especially in the Black community, is that support. So like, um, when you say existing in a Black body, right? I, I love that. Can you explain some of the uh, hurdles that you had to overcome existing in the uh, existing in this black vehicle, right? Yeah. And trying to figure out the your you know your identity because I think we all go through that. Like you know, um, prime example. I growing up, I was raised in a Baptist and apostolic you know household uh, family, and just trying to figure out why can I wear the suits going to church okay um trying to and and I knew I, I had a sense of myself I knew um that I, I I wanted to be a boy I didn't have no terminology or gender pronouns or anything like that I just knew what I felt and what I wanted to be so tell us about that experience yeah yeah it's a wild it's a wild experience um you know so speaking for myself right like I, uh, I'm an only child. Mm -hmm. I'm the only child of my mom and my dad. Um, they did not get married, which was both of their mutual choice. And they broke up when I was about three or four years old. Um, and my mom was my primary parent growing up, but really, really, you know, despite her drama with my dad, she was like, no, like he's going to be a part of your life. And the rest of that family is going to be a part of your life. That, that's your blood. That's your family. Um, right. And so I, I kind of had this fortune challenge of being in two households, essentially. Right. So my dad and his family are, are in Brooklyn. They're still based in Brooklyn. Uh, but my mom decided when I, again, when I was like three or four years old, she was like, we got to get out of here. This child is not going to thrive in in these streets. Um, and, you know, that's like I was a toddler. Right. Like there was no broader sense of an intuition, I think, um, and her own lived experience, of course, as a Black woman uh, and growing up here of being like, actually, I think I want something different for her. I think I want something different. Um, so we moved to Connecticut when I was three or four years old, uh, grew up in a house in Bridgeport. Uh, for the first five or six years of my life, we were commuting back and forth. My mom and my dad were both train operators for the city of New York for MTA. Um, wonderfully steady jobs that are still, um, you know, giving them their point, even though now they're retired. So blessings on blessings, right? Mm -hmm. um, but growing up between New York and Connecticut was a very special experience. So I had, I had this really um, diverse, you know, quote unquote, my multicultural experience um, between the schools I was going to in New York. And it's funny that you mentioned religion and faith, right? Because my family is also Baptist, um, but in a, in a casual way. And I remember, um, I remember going to church regularly. Uh, I remember having like a kid's version of the Bible. I remember going to Bible camp. My mom enrolled me in a private Christian school from first to fifth grade. So we had Bible classes, we had chapel on Wednesdays, you know, we had all of this stuff. Um, and it's really interesting to reflect on some of that because I think from a really early age, um, I know that I'm a deeply empathetic and emotional being, and that has always been the case. And to feel that and to feel like that wasn't the experience of other little boys, right, which is what I thought that I had to be, had to be at the time. Um, and the other, the other um, you know, moments where you're like, I think I kind of had to conform or else I'm going to be ostracized. Like, when you know, you know. Um, and I really, I spent a lot of time uh, creating a narrative for myself, which was essentially that pain and repression were actually necessary, uh, that they were expected and important to my, to my experience, that they would make me a stronger person, make me a better person. Um, and I still remember having fantasies when I was, you know, seven, eight years old, straight up. Like, I remember having a conversation with my dad being like, you know, I think I want to have a daughter one day. And so very early on, like projecting my own gender, like fantasies and hopes onto someone different, 
right? Mm -hmm. Like someone in my lineage who was not in fact me because I didn't think it was a possibility for me. Um, and similarly, I remember being like, you know, in third or fourth grade and being like, hey mom, like I would love like if you adopted a daughter, like I would love mm -hmm. to have a sister, right? And so all these ways that my connection to women and to femmes and femininity broadly were coming up and how, how often, you know, again, I'm blessed. <laughs> I know this. And my family has, they've learned a lot since I came out to them, which was roughly, you know, two or three years ago. Um, but when I was growing up, you know, it's knee jerk for them, right? In so many ways, the history of Black folks in this country is one of doing what we need to do to survive, assimilating as a means of, of security and safety, um, and sometimes by any means necessary, right? Often to, to our detriment, to our intergenerational detriment. And so I, I can remember the conversations I would have with my mom and my dad when I was starting to, you know, when I was starting to go through puberty and starting to be like, this feels different. Like, sure, this is something that my body is going through right now, but like, it feels out of whack where there are questions that I'm having that I don't really feel like you're giving me answers about. Um, and just having those moments and, those, and trying to have those conversations, again, like being a very empathetic and vulnerable person uh, from an early age, trying to have those conversations and, and just facing a wall. And then, so basically from sixth through 12th grade, so middle school, basically, through all of high school, I went to school in Connecticut, right? And so the people around me, the friend groups I started to create shifted drastically. Like I remember in middle school, elementary school, like I had black friends. I had friends who spoke more than one language, like all this stuff. That started to change once I started to go to school in Connecticut. And so even the, you know, whether it was a personality thing or a sexuality or a gender thing, a lot of what I was actually seeing on the day to day was being represented by white people. Uh, and so between my parents being like, mm, you shouldn't be this way, you should be this way because this is who I think you are and you should be. And then feeling differently and seeing some of those differences reflected in people who look nothing like me was like, oh shit, well, this is a white thing. <laughs> um, I can't, I, this is even more reinforcement as to why I can't embody this thing, right? And so, you know, I, I can say that like, it took until probably my sophomore, junior year of high school to even be like, I think I might be kind of gay. Like I, there's some, like something is different. And I think that this is the thing that is different. And these are the people that I'm looking to, to connect with and learn from and, and, and lean into. Like, this is something that is, is going to nurture me. Right. And so joining, you know, the LGBTQ club at my high school and being like, mm, I'm an ally, but like, I'm definitely not just an ally. Um, you know, so it took a minute for me to even start to like reckon with, some of these deeper truths, which I've been kind of aware of for a long time. Um, but, you know, again, it, it really took, I know that we're, we're leaning into resiliency, we're leaning into healing, but like the grief, the trauma that I, uh, like in some instances allowed myself to go through and or had to go through is really wild to think about. I, I feel like I've only been able to actively um, move through a lot of it in the last four or five years, again, through community, through having access to psychotherapy, like all of these things, which everybody does not have, right? A lot of people who look like us do not have. Um, so it, it's, I'm very grateful to be here and be the person that I, that I am and I was always supposed to be. I love it, love it. I mean, we have so much to come. First of all, I was born and raised in Connecticut, New Haven. Okay. Oh, damn. <laughs> Literally, like I just left Connecticut uh, in 2018. I just happened to go traveling, right? And I planned to go back. Um, and I didn't go back. I met my wife and she lived in St. Louis, stayed out there for the past three years. And now we're here in Atlanta, Georgia right. uh, for a year now, a year and counting, actually. So, um, man, it's, it, that's, that's awesome. And I definitely can relate because I went to middle school, uh, K through eight, 
Um, so I didn't have to make too many transitions there. But then my mother wanted to send me out to Fairfield County. So that's how I know about Bridgeport. And uh, so I went to Notre Dame and Catholic high school. Wow. Yeah, uh, co-ed ND and um, went out there and experienced the uh, private school experience and just not even knowing I, I was so sheltered in my little bubble <laughs> because my, my family, even though we were in the inner city, yeah. They were conscious of the things that go on in the inner city. So I was very sheltered. Um, and yeah, it was just a different experience between the, the everyday prayers in every classroom and the mass. And I didn't even know anything about communion. I, I thought, you know, at first um, I thought that I had to go up there until I realized it was just a different religion. So that's how sheltered I was. But anyway, I loved how you said inter internal generation intergenerational intergenerational and how we embody that growing up right i was just reading about systems internal systems mm. and how there's different parts of us um that are not connected that are not harmonious and that separation and isolation within our own being because of the programming that has been implemented into our systems right into our minds as children and um just as beings that's navigating this this world we just have these certain um processes that we live life by and it's amazing how you kind of explained that because I think all of us uh, can relate to that just having to figure out your identity amongst the constructs that have been amongst the boundaries and limitations that have been uh, created around you and I like to say that you know I, I came I started my transition when I was 30 and prior to that decision I literally was imprisoned <laughs> the whole time prior because I didn't feel like I had a voice to communicate myself because, you know, growing up in the black community, it's sit down, don't talk, don't ask questions, you know, obey, 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 <laughs> obey when you get home, obey when you go to school, obey when you go to church, let's just sit down and be quiet pretty much. Um, and if you're expressing or if they see anything different about you, they try to change it, you know, it's. Um, so yeah, man, that's, that's just, um, amazing. And how you were talking about like projecting your fantasies. I could relate to that so much because I would dream that I was male and wake up so depressed because that wasn't my reality. And I had five other siblings and they were boys at five brothers. And here I am the only, uh, assigned female at birth, you know, wondering why, and just being upset with that, kind of envying that, honestly, to be transparent. I was envying the opposite gender because I couldn't be it. I felt that I just had to settle. And the spirit that resided in me was not a settling spirit. It was very rebellious, as society likes to say. But it wasn't about being rebellious. It just was about being authentic. And this was not the spirit that is aligning with these binary ways of being that you're teaching me um it, the programming was not fitting in this system okay <laughs> i was like an imac and, and 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 they're like you know lenovo or something so it wasn't it wasn't aligning yeah um so when you talk about fantasies i just i would look in the mirror just envision myself with a beard or um just hoping that bottom parts would change and mm -hmm. maybe when i get older they'll evolve or something like that so i do want to pinpoint that with me constantly having this on my mind and having these fantasies and allowing the imaginary, the imaginative being of me, essence of me, explore mentally how me today looking in the mirror and seeing this beard and walking in this world and being affirmed as male, it just shows that, you know, there is a creative genius that resides in you and that you're, and, and that you must explore. And I think as children, that's what we were, um, that's what naturally came to us, but was taken away from us because of the programming that society continues to put in our minds and it takes away from us being imaginative because if we ex if we uh communicate our imagination to adults they're like you're crazy or, or child please you know they they're shutting it down or blocking it immediately so you find yourself just living in your mind by yourself um yeah oh, so <laughs>
I just wanted to, that's, that's just super cool. Um, so when you became, so as you said, you were going back and forth from New York, you have the New York culture, you have the Connecticut culture. Can you experience some of the differences that you were experiencing, you know, in these two different environments? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really interesting point. Um, you know, the, the irony of, of my school, my schooling in New York was that I was around people who looked like me, um, but I had to go my ass back home to Connecticut every night, right? Unless it was a Friday, in which case I was going to my dad's in Brooklyn. And, my, and this school was in like, it was like ne near the Bronx, right? So it was like nowhere near where my family in Brooklyn was living. Um, and so there was still this level of isolation that I had to deal with, right? Where I would go through my days and often feel, you know, some level of camaraderie, like connection to my peers. Um, but I would still, I would still feel, I would still feel effeminate. I would still feel effeminate. I would still feel like I didn't quite belong. I would feel like the ideas that I was having um, were not the ideas that other people were having and not being able to connect with folks after school um, or really having like a social life with my, with my classmates after, you know, 4 p.m., whatever, during the school day, it gave me more of that time that you were referencing of like imagination, like solo time, right? Which was like, it's important, it's, it's natural, um, but again, as an only child, and it was just me and my mom, like it was just me and my mom in Connecticut, period. Um, and her thing with me was always like giving me more than she ever had, um, making sure that I was always safe and uh, in an environment that would protect me and nurture me. Um, but she was also the type to be like, watch your back don't trust anyone. Um, and, you know, so there's a lot of conflicting messages that I got to move through, um, especially between those transitions from elementary school, middle school, high school, between the different states. Um, I can definitely say that, like, you know, almost inevitably, I was able to, like, and I say inevitably because adolescence is a trip. <laughs> um, things that you maybe conceived of as a, as a child, pre-teenage time, like it, it just becomes so amplified and it's a shared experience that we all have, right? So there were so many more of those like glimpses, those moments where I was like, this feels some type of way and I'm into it. Um, but honestly, the way that I, the way that I started to move through things, I think especially once I was in school in Connecticut and of an older age, was really starting to, um, to almost over invest in heteronormativity, cis heteronormativity. Um, and so I would project so, so much onto the people around me. I remember being in like sixth grade, I had my first girlfriend, right? Um, and that, it was a deeply emotional relationship, almost asexual. Like there was almost no sexual connection happening at that time despite like all the hormones and whatever, it was like such a deeply emotional and gratifying relationship that I had with like an eighth grader at the time. And I'm, I'm sharing this for like context for the way that I found myself repeatedly connecting with girls or women throughout my life um, and really leaning on them in a way that went beyond just like a regular friendship or a regular relationship. Like it spoke to something different in me that I felt was being nurtured, but still couldn't fully explicitly acknowledge. Um, and that's, that's something that I still, I'm still thinking through. Um, and it ties into so much of like the, the self-worth, right? There's a, there's a reason why, there's a reason why this messaging and, and these means of indoctrination have such a poisonous effect on everyone, right? Not just trans folks. And it's because like, if we are sick, if we think that the world needs to be a certain way, other people are gonna make money off of that. They literally profit off of our misery, off of our confusion, off of our anger. Um, 
And so when you talk about that feeling of imprisonment, that like, that resonates with me so deeply. Um, and one of the many, many things that I believe in deeply that guides me, not just as a person, but in terms of my own politics, is like, I believe in liberation. I'm not out here trying to think of humane prisons. I'm out here trying to think of what a world looks like without them, period. And the same goes for cops because it all reinforces the same stuff, which is wild. And again, it's how it's how our people survive, right? Um, I get I get the the reasoning behind it, but there comes a point where we gotta imagine something different. Uh, and I feel like we're starting to reach. I know that we're starting to reach it, right? It's it's evident in the way that conservatives are trying to erase us um, with all this legislation and the violence that they are inciting against us. That like we're reaching a, a turning point, a tipping point. Um, where the lies, the myths are no longer serving us. And people are like, actually, we need to do something about this. Okay. Um, yes. Right? <laughs> it's been time, but like, it's getting, it's getting worse and worse, mm -hmm. um, you know? So I, I think about all these things and the way that I was, I was trying to move through, move through the world. And, and, and again, like identifying like, oh, like, this isn't actually about you, right? Like I would go through a lot of relationships and there would be a lot of challenges and, and, and discomfort. And I would get really defensive about a lot of a lot of stuff. Mm. And all of it, of course, wasn't related to, to my being closeted, um, but it, it's, it's hard not to identify the connections between the two and the lack of, of self-worth, of, of dignity, um, of self-love you know, it made it made it so that I had barriers in the way that I could connect with people, in the way that I could show up for others. Um, and so, recognizing that and seeing the way that like that has transformed for me, seeing the way that being authentic, like you said, practicing vulnerability, sharing space like this, it is transformative. It mm -hmm. is revolutionary. And I'm like, oh, like this is a, like I think about I think about 11, 12 year old me having whole ass conversations with adults, like 30, 40 year olds being like, I, I'm feeling this way, I'm thinking this way. And then being like, yo, what? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right, you would have thought they were watching a Kung Fu movie. Like, when they, what's the, where's the subtitles, you know? <laughs> I don't understand. Yeah, yeah, but, the, but, and that's the funny part, right? It's like so many people are so detached again. It's mm. a experience, and and to have those moments, those again, those really small moments where people be like, "Oh shit, you're onto something!" Like I feel that, like I'm talking about this, and again, like it being a completely like different peer group, age group, whatever. And now to realize, like, oh okay, like this is what, this is what, this is how I've always been. Like this is how I was always supposed to move through the world. Mm. Um, this is the person I've always been uh, supposed to be, and these are the spaces that I'm supposed to be helping, creating, facilitating with others. Because, like, this is—I mean, to me, this is part of how we get free. Like, all mm -hmm. of us. I love it because people like to say, "Oh, you're transgender, or you're a minority," or they put you in this um, uh, <laughs> underprivileged. Mm -hmm. um, inferior uh boxes right where they tell you that you're beneath me whoever you know these majority folk yeah. um and i love it because being us unique creative individuals right mm -hmm. these spiritual beings navigating this um earthly realm and you said creating spaces right and i love that because that's our purpose. That's our mission. That's what I truly feel is my assignment that I am in alignment with. It's thinking outside the box instead of living in the box. Okay. I mean, that's where most of the pain is right there. I mean, can you, I mean, let's just, let's, let's great people that's listening to this podcast, right? Yeah. Can you imagine yourself getting the box from U-Haul? All right. Putting it together and putting yourself in it. That's going to be a painful experience, okay? That's all I'm saying. That's how you're living your life. That's so, right. <laughs> and and because I because I have been conscious, now I am aware of the infinite being in which I am. Okay, yeah. it. 
Hey, great people. I hope you're enjoying the interview. I want to take a brief moment to thank our sponsors. Please know your contribution helps maintain and sustain this platform. I want to thank 50 Faces Podcast, AJ Bakes, Aristocrat Intelligence, Be Down Enterprises, Divine Divine Co., Dr. Scholar Lee, LLC, Greenlight Workplace Solutions, Omega Tree Trust, LLP, and Transparent Life Conversations, LLC. And I want to take a brief moment to specially thank sponsor 50 Faces Podcast. The 50 Faces Podcast tells the stories of extraordinary people and exploring ideas through podcasts. It creates a library of diverse role models who tell their career stories because you can't be what you can't see. And a special thank you to Transparent Life Conversations, LLC, whose purpose and mission is to make sure the identities of transgender non-conforming individuals are affirmed and they experience a healthy transition that adds to their well-being and quality of life. They help parents of transgender children cope and overcome the challenges they experience being a parent of a gender expansive child. Also, Transparent Life Conversations serve organizations to help create trans-inclusive work environments to ensure transgender non-conforming employees thrive in the workplace. Please visit www.transparentlifeconversations.com to learn more about services and or to schedule a free consultation. You may also email inquiries to info at transparentlifeconversations.com. Lastly, if you're interested in donating and or being a sponsor, please email info at drscholarleeexperience.com. You can send donations to Cash App, which is dollar sign Dr. Scholar Lee. PayPal, which is at Dr. Scholar Lee, and or you can use the email for PayPal and Zelle, which is info at drscholarlee.com. I thank you so much in advance. All right, great people. Let's get back to the interview. I'm too big for a box. I'm too big for this uh, small way of living life or this limited way, I should say, this limited way of living life because I, I have an understanding. I, I left the understanding. I now I, I started with the understanding, which is the self awareness, which is who I am, and not being scared to say this is who I am, and not being scared to be different than what other people are operating their lives, um, and that is scary because people shun being different. Yeah. You know, they uh, crucified Jesus for being different. He was a healer. He was out here doing things that the king and normal folks couldn't do. And uh -huh. millions loved him and uh, a lot envied that. Mm -hmm. And how, how do I eliminate this powerful being, this unique being, and still be able to maintain my egotistical way uh, uh, self-love about me? Um and so I feel like us as transgender individuals, when we live, when we thrive, when we are ex um, uh, living our lives openly and freely and not being scared, fearlessly, courageously, now you have this heteronormative uh, fear. It's like, okay, how dare you? <laughs> Why are you speaking? You're not supposed to speak. People are not supposed to know you exist. So let me get rid of you because you're now, um, what is it? Um, compare, contrast. You're now uh, going against the yeah. teachings that I am implementing. Yeah. So I have to now say that you're evil so people don't listen to you. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to say that you're wrong and that you're going to go to hell and all this other stuff. I have, yeah. to, I have to put this in people's minds so that way when you express this um, authentic way of being, even though your formality is different, yeah, no, I got to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. um, so when you talk about the defensiveness that you had experienced and the lack of self-worth, I could just like, I, I can align with that so much. And I'm sure all of us in the transgender non-conforming community can align with that because I didn't love myself for, th for 30 years. Yeah. I, because one, I gratified myself for people pleasing right? I made grandma happy. I made mommy happy. I made everybody happy. And at the same time, I was uncomfortable. I was compromising my truth to make other people comfortable around me. Mm -hmm. And so to make 
people comfortable around me, I had to suppress my truth. I had to not talk about certain things because talking about it or bringing it to their consciousness is going to trigger, like you said, that curiosity, like, what are you talking about? You know, or that like, okay, that's, that's too strange, stranger danger. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So Jay, um, you did mention back, uh, I'm going to just go in reverse for a little bit. You did mention about relationships. I did want to touch on that. Can you tell us, your experience with uh, romantic or, you know, love relationships, uh, being trans feminine, um, and even if you want to touch on prior to you being aware of your trans identity. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, I've been a romantic person for a very long time. I consider my, um, my love and compassion for people to be a part of my transness, a part of my queer identity. Um, and it's definitely something that I've recognized and struggled with for a long time. Um, yeah, I mean, romantic relationships, you know, I, I, as an only child, I really felt like I had to seek community, uh, and find people outside of my family unit to really like connect with people who are my peers. Um, so that was a reality from the jump. Uh, and then, you know, I think it was really once I started being in middle school that I actually wanted to start dating, um, like the moment that I was like 10 or 11 years old. But even before that, and I think we talked about this a little bit in the other, in some of the other sections that we talked about, um, you know, just this projection, right? So not exactly coming to terms with my transness, but having a sense that I was more inclined towards feminine things or, um, you know, elements of femininity. Um, and the way that that showed up, whether it was having a lot of girl, like femme or women identifying friends growing up, um, like my, my best friend for a long time was my next door neighbor. Um, and like we, you know, we hung out like every day. Um, and so there were just a lot of moments where I would be thinking about, um, you know, how I felt and how I fit in. But I think more than that, it was always a question of how uh, good I felt in people's company and how often that the people that I felt best with were women or girls at the time. Um, And, you know, like looking back, and this is something that I continue to like uh, assess and kind of be amused by is that a lot of my partners, the partners that I've had who have identified as women um, or been female identifying, the majority of them have been queer. Um, you know, and it hasn't always been a situation where we have both been out, um, but it has often been like a part of the conversation or part of, um, you know, the initial kind of like meeting um, and, and interest, I think, mutually. And so that's another, that's another really, I don't know, it's kind of, it feels like a coincidence, but I know that it is not a coincidence, right? Like, um, I was attracted to and attracting the people who, um, you know, would be into me uh, and see me for me, even before I had the words to really articulate who that was and and what those identities were. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of high school, I was, and this is another really interesting thing is, you know, I think that the internalized transphobia and like, frankly, queer phobia, right? So there was a long time where I was like, I think that I'm attracted to people who are not just women or we're not just men, but like anyone. Um, and of course, when, when I was growing up, that wasn't really an option. It wasn't something that was super visible. Uh, and so I would, I would really, I put a lot of stock into kind of like, you know, the cis normative like fantasy of like, okay, like I am a boy, I will be a man. That means that I'm going to get married. That means that I'm going to have a wife, like going to have children, like the whole thing became kind of like a contest for me in a really weird way where it it became a source of validation um, and I think worth or worthiness for me uh, in a lot of ways. And so, you know, really in high school, I I was kind of like bending over backwards um, and trying to like connect with girls. And the part of it was absolutely, you know, romantic and sexual, but I think there was a deeper element to it, right? That was like, me not being able to be my full self and so needing someone to um to embody these things that i felt like um were empowering were inspiring were you know attractive 
um, and in really thinking that it had to be someone else. It could not be me. Um, and you know that so that that was really consistent um uh mentality that i think i carried for for a really long time um you know i mentioned that i've been with my partner my current partner now for for seven years so we met when i was still in college um we actually met my like our both of our freshman year so we we're in the same class um but did not actually get together until our senior year um and you know, she identifies as queer as well. Um, so that was, you know, consistent. Um, but when we got together, I was, I was still identifying as, as a man. Um, and we were, you know, 20, 21 years old at that time. And while I was feeling more and more comfortable in, in my sexuality at the time, I identified as bisexual. Now I go by bisexual, pansexual, whichever. Um, but yeah, it was, it was kind of a, a beginning. It, we created kind of a safe space for each other because I don't think that either of us had been in a relationship before that where we've been really intentional and kind of um, talking about our sexuality and not just being like, this is how I am and this is what I'm attracted to, but actually talking about like, was this your experience growing up? Like, there was a lot of like trauma processing uh, and healing that we were able to uh, to do together uh, and early on in our relationship, just purely around sexuality. And obviously sexuality, the people you're attracted to, your preferences are different from your gender identity and your expression. But I would be lying if I said that because that was the basis of our relationship, that was the foundation of our relationship, that it didn't give me the confidence uh, and the ability to explore my gender uh, comfortably in this relationship and kind of confide in my partner uh, in a way that I had in previous relationships, you know, I remember graduating and starting to really reconsider my gender and being like, oh no, like, you know, I had the moment of, um, of fear that I think a lot of trans folks go through where when you come to terms with who you are and you have some idea of how you can show up in that way, you're like, I'm going to get crucified. You know, I am going to be punished for uh, becoming this person, for embodying who I really am. Um, and that was immediately my fear, right? But even with that being the case, I was still able to have a conversation, many conversations with my partner where I was like, you know, I think I want to start wearing these kinds of clothes. I think I want to start investing in bras, you know? And initially, I very much thought that it was um, the denial kind of crept in still. And I, I told myself, oh, it's just cross-dressing. Right. And of course, now, four or five years later, I can recognize that that was those were like the beginning steps of me coming out, um, like starting my transition in like a very uh, isolated type of way, like a very limited type of way. Um, but again, like, I don't know. And I, and, I, and I say this to my partner all the time. I don't know what my transition would have looked like without her support, um, without the relationship that we you know, have built together. Um, yeah, she she really like has held me down in so many different ways. But I think specific to, to coming out and, and transitioning, you know, really gave me a sense of safety and comfort um, and no judgment, which isn't to say that there weren't difficult conversations and it don't continue to be, you know, conversations around everything, but it was never, and I think that this is also a lot of trans people's worst fears, especially in romantic and sexual relationships, um, early in transitioning, I think, especially, um, where you're like, oh, if I, if I talk about this, they're going to break up with me. Um, there's that immediate fear of rejection uh, and abandonment that I think a lot of us carry and, and have to navigate. Um, and, you know, it wasn't a one and done type situation. Like, uh, we had those conversations at the beginning where I was like, I think I want to start wearing these types of clothes. More conversations around like, I think I'm not binary. More conversations being like, oh, I am trans. Like that is a part of my my non-binary identity. I want to take hormones. Like, you know, it's all a continuous thing, but at no point, and I feel very blessed and fortunate for this, at no point have I kind of been like, well, this is gonna, this is gonna end things. Like I'm not gonna be able to be with this person. Um, after we have this conversation or after I share this information with them. 
Um, yeah, that thankfully has not been the case for us. And I know that that is rare, sadly, for trans and cis relationships. I mean, it's definitely rare, okay? <laughs> um, I only, you know, I have, I actually have a couple of questions because um, you have a, you bring a unique perspective, uh, not perspective, a unique experience, okay? Um, when it comes to your intimate relationships, you know, and your um, evolution, right, into uh, transforming into the, into your trans femininity, right? Or becoming one with your femininity, I should say. So, um, you had mentioned that, um, I, I do remember you had mentioned, um, having that emotional connection with, uh, women and how it was kind of, you know, more deep, deeper than the average relationship connection right it was more intimate it was more uh soul connecting right um can you describe uh that that soul experience that you had um being in the relationship with um you know another female identifying mm -hmm. female mm -hmm. yeah yeah i <laughs> again like as a romantic i've been i've been in a lot of relationships and i think um there, there's good and bad to this, but like I'm taking it holistically. I'm taking it as as it was and as it is. Um, I think, yeah, the majority of my relationships with women have been very emotionally uh, intense and more often than not emotionally secure. Um, I think some of the like most uh, illuminating or like affirming elements of those relationships for me have has really been like this sense of um, not needing to perform. Mm. You know, I, I think uh, we talk a lot about visibility and representation and performance and like all these things feed into each other as trans folks, but um, there is there is a kind of real you uh, that I think a lot of folks are able to um, to shift into, to move into when they are in a relationship uh, or, or within community. So, you know, maybe relationship with multiple different people and creating a space, but talking about intimate relationships, romantic relationships, I think that there does come a point where you're like, I can be the real me around you. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, those moments would often, those initial moments would kind of come up um, sexually, right? So, when I would be with someone and we, you know, would start kissing or whatever, there was like that immediate, you know, they talk about the spark, but mm -hmm. this was like a different type of spark. It was like, a, I feel like we're kind of mirroring each other. Mm -hmm. um, and like, it's so hard to describe. <laughs> like there's, there's kind of like an out of body type experience to it. Um, I think when at least speaking for myself, when when I was connecting with people who like really saw me, um, I, I think that there's something really important behind that because I could recognize that it was happening, but in reality still had a ton of self-hatred, right? A ton of internalized phobias that were preventing me from even like actively embodying who I was and who I wanted to be. Um, but in those moments uh, of connection, of intimacy, of physical intimacy, um, I would often have that sense of like, oh, like, this is like, this is what good feels like. Um, and, you know, that wasn't always the case, of course, when it came to non-physical stuff, all the emotional growth that I still had to go through mm -hmm. um, to not be as self-destructive and, and toxic in a lot of different ways. But there were those moments, those initial moments where I was like, you get me. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, it, it goes beyond words, right? It's like, a, it's a sensation. Um, it's a sense of clarity. It's kind of electrifying when you uh, when you realize it with someone else. Mm. Yeah, and um, I, I would touch on the internalized phobias, but I, I'll just because I've, I, you know, and this doesn't have to do with being gendered. Okay, we, all of us have internalized phobias, and it's because we're programmed to operate a certain way. So when we are evolving and we're getting older, and we're realizing that you know what this system isn't, isn't in alignment with my being, you know, and that's a phobia because how do you become, 
<laughs> in this systematic way of operation. So I, I really won't kind of touch on internalized phobias because all of us have them. It's just, we have to get to a, it's, it's more so how do I obtain an inner knowing? How do I obtain that knowing and be okay with that knowing? How do I get to the level of accepting my knowing yeah. so that way I can live and be who I who I know that I am, right? Yeah. So what was that process like in knowing, you know, getting in alignment with that knowing and saying, you know what, overcoming those phobias? Because I, I really like to take a resilient approach. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what was that like? Yeah, that's really interesting to think about because um, it took so much time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think a lot of that work happened for me over the last three or four years, which have coincided with therapy for me. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think another part of it is like my, my partner and I, we like, we love talking mm -hmm. and there is, there is so much good that can come from healthy and consistent communication. Um, as you know, I think we both know, and a lot of people know, um, of course it is hard. Uh, a lot of people have different reasons why they can't engage in that way all the time. But again, I feel very fortunate to have, um, to have my partner be someone who is quite similar to me in that way. Mm -hmm. Right. Like when we first started, when we first started seeing each other, like we were texting each other so much, like just giving each other all the details about how we were feeling and what we were thinking about. And that like, you know, that translated into our relationship. We were long distance for some time. And so there was still that like virtual or, you know, text-based kind of communication. And when we would see each other, it would feel like, oh, like it's still here. Like it isn't just a thing that is ha existing when we're at, at a distance, right? Um, so I, I think that there's just kind of, a, I don't want to say it's all about luck and chance, right? Because like, you know, I, 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 I want to say that we get along because we're the people that we are. Uh, and that is not a coincidence, but the fact that we went to the same school and all that stuff, like, you know, that could have not happened easily. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's a huge part of that, you know, our relationship has been a huge part of what's, um, yeah, what's kind of given me that, that space to move through things. Um, you know, I, another part of this is, and this is again, like a very much this is about me, um, but I also, um, I identify as polyamorous, mm -hmm. um, right? And so I believe that it is possible to have deep love, connection, and compassion for more than one person mm -hmm. um, in a romantic way, uh, in a physical way, in an emotional way, generally. Um, and, you know, I was able to explore that again in the safety of my current relationship um, we were able to explore that, you know, two or three years ago, um, pre-pandemic and being able to, it was kind of a test drive for me in a lot of ways, right? Because it was at that point that I was like, oh, okay, like I can, I can be okay with presenting myself as I am. Um, and I'm gonna, t I, I feel comfortable enough, confident enough to put myself out here on these apps to, to match with strangers and see what's what, right? Like just really having like faith in uh, people not being hostile towards me or judgmental or whatever. Um, and I think that for the most part, like that was, that was a pretty affirming experience um, in a lot of ways. There were still moments, right, where you know, it, it was clearly, clearly some people were looking for something different than what I was yeah. looking for, what I was interested in. But I think when it comes to, you know, cultivating a sense of like self-love, when it comes to, when it came to coming to terms with my trans identity and my queer identities, um, I was able to match with people who were having similar journeys, right? Yeah. So either they had recently come out or they had already been out, either they uh, were trans identifying or had like a lot of trans and gender expansive people in their circles and networks. Um, you know, so being able to connect with others, and this is like, this is part of why I think, you know, what you're doing in this podcast is so like powerful, is like just that knowledge of other people having similar or shared experiences with you uh, can give you the firm footing that you need to like, to, to be in your own skin. 
um, you know, to really say, oh, this is, this is okay. Like the world is not going to end if I choose to live my truth um, and exist in this way. Um, so I could, I could really, you know, again, a lot, part of it was my own internal work, like in therapy, which is a lot to unpack. Um, but then I think another part of it was, was kind of having like the, the willingness, um, and it's not to undermine like the fear, the anxieties around like, is this person going to like me? Like, are people going to kind of like ostracize me for being who I am? Um, but I think, you know, being able to make those connections and suss those things out really helped give me uh, a better sense of like, oh, okay, like this is, this is who I am. Like, I'm going to keep exploring this. Um, and, and, you know, who's here for it is going to be here for it. And if they're not, then like, that's their thing. Yeah. You know? I love that because uh, thank you, first of all, for being so transparent on this platform, um, because I was going to touch on that when you had mentioned that, um, you know, you pretty much um, your your partner, your current partner allowed you to explore life within the relationship. Mm -hmm. And I was going to touch on, you know, how did that exploration look like? So you had mentioned that, you know, you're polyamorous and, um, you know, me personally, I feel like, you know, if you love yourself, right, mm -hmm. you will love it's it'll be easy for you to love people. Mm -hmm. Then you find yourself loving all aspects of you, right? Because people hold different aspects of you and mm -hmm. you find yourself attracted to these certain aspects and there's nothing sinful about that. Okay, great people. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what people have been teaching you these days, but okay. So, you know, there's nothing sinful about that. No, you know, it really isn't because even, even me and you having the connection right? And I, I support your life. That, that's me supporting me. Why? Because I support myself. So I can easily transition or transfer, that is, mm -hmm. transfer that love onto other people. But right. if, if I'm living a limited life, okay, mm -hmm. and I'm acting most of my life under one gender role, it's kind of hard to even uh, be open to loving anybody outside of the limitations I put my, I'm loving myself under. That's right. I'm myself under these limitations of being just a uh, half of a being instead yeah. of a whole of a being, then it's it's just it's not even about understanding. It's about can I affirm, can I accept? Right. So when you accept all of you, then now you find yourself seeing love in, in different expressions, right? Like I don't have the courage to wear a different color hairstyle, but I love the fact that you do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, some men don't find the courage to wear pink, but look at me. All yeah. right. So <laughs> I mean, some simple like that. And when people say, you know, if you heard that saying, uh, you know, I live my life through you, I don't know what they call that, but when people say that, you know, it's true and people live their life through other people, but sometimes people envy how other people live their lives because they don't have the withal to live their life yeah. the, according to the standards in which you're living, in which you're saying, you know what, I'm going to be me. The world ain't going to go nowhere because I choose to be me. Um, if anything, the world's going to evolve because I chose to evolve, okay? <laughs> I started creating my story instead of living history. Now, okay, there you go. So, <laughs> um, so being that, you know, you're uh, polyamorous and you're living an explorative life, right? Because I truly feel us as spiritual beings, we are meant to explore life, not conform. Um, that's the main barrier right there. And you talk about, um, you know, having, um, you feeling like you had this contest, this source of validation that you are seeking, right? You're yearning for, and now you've become awakened to who you are and you're living your truth and you're seeing that love is being reciprocated. Like, how does that feel? You know, explain those emotions um, mm -hmm. and hopes. And I ask this question because I want people to feel empowered to know that love, love is out there, great people, but you have to love yourself. Um, and I, I say that because I was listening to, um, I, was, I was on YouTube listening to someone speak and they said that in order, just think of the positive. Don't think about karma is, be, karma is created because in your mind, you're thinking about something bad happening 
or mm. because this concept of being the systematic, the, the things that have been programmed in your system is, mm. you know, have you think in this way. But if you just focus on positive, great people, then positive will be reciprocated, positive will be uh, exemplified in, in all facets from the from your dog to your friends to your spouse to your to your parents to, to yourself. OK, you got to love yourself It's a reflection in everything you do, even the environments you walk in, you're going to walk into loving environments. Why? Because that's what you and body as your being that's the that's the vibration you are giving out in this world so i asked this question i don't went on the tinge okay i, I asked this question because i want you to just talk about like the the loving essence like like just the the heaven sent the you know yeah just to, yeah there you go <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah it's um it's liberating um i think it is probably the strongest word i can i can lend to it and as part of that, it's transformative. Um, and I, I think that those are really, I think those are words that are um, maybe overused or uh, misunderstood, mm -hmm. but I wanna, I really wanna, um, I wanna exemplify, I wanna explain why those are the words that I chose because when I was, when I was younger, when I was in the closet, when I was trying to be someone who I fundamentally was not, uh, especially in the context of seeking other people out, right? So like after middle school being like, oh, I need a girlfriend um, and bringing that kind of energy, that level of, of, um, of conformity of kind of like an obligatory thing. I think that a lot of people, unfortunately, because of the systems that we live in, the capitalistic systems that we live in, most specifically, they see love as a very transactional game, mm. uh, transactional game, like, I am giving you something and you are giving me something and also there will be a winner and there will be a loser in this relationship. Um, and that was where I was coming from for a very long time. I think it's where a lot of people come from, frankly. Um, and it was only in the last three or four years that I really started to reflect, right? I was like, I've been moving a certain way for like a decade and I am deeply unhappy. Like I feel very lucky to be in the relationship that I'm in you know, the relationship that I've been talking about with my partner, this is past me, so 21 year old me, um, saying, you know, this is good, but like a lot of other stuff still feels off. I still feel like I am at the, the edge or the precipice of something truly incredible, and I don't know how to get there. And it took that reframing for myself saying, oh, it's like, I don't need to be 100% in control of the people I'm in relationship with. It is actually on both of us to be accountable to each other. It is on both of us to be compassionate with each other and to be able to hold each other even when things are difficult or we're, you know, having a, an adverse reaction to something that's happened. Um, you know, really starting to question the kind of internal logics of like, you know, well, you're upset, so I'm gonna get upset, right? Like there's a lot of talk around matching people's energy. And there is there is a significance to that, of course, especially when it comes to matters of self-defense. But when you are in right relationship, when you, when you are in a healthy and mutual relationship with someone, we owe each other more than that, right? Um, it isn't like you're upset this one day and so I'm done with you. Um, and so there was a lot of that mentality that I had to, to deprogram for myself. And, you know, over the, over the course of the last four or five years, I've been able to do that um, in a really significant way. And I can say it feels like I'm breathing. Mm. It, it, it feels like, you know, in comparison, I was only able to, I was drowning, right? I'm, I'm trying to tread water. I don't know why it's so hard, but I'm still trying to do it. And the breaths are not coming easily. They are labored, they're intermittent, inconsistent. And now I'm like firmly above the water, right? If I wanna go into it, I can, but if I don't, then I don't. Um, and it's that sense of, of internal uh, control, I think is that, that, that harmony, that, um, you know, that self-love that, that we've been talking about, um, I think is really what it takes to let go. I think there's, there's so much freedom in letting stuff go, especially when it comes down to, um, you know, really adhering to norms uh, or essentially like policing ourselves and imprisoning each other 
in this really weird mental gymnastics. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that the best feelings of love that I've experienced, especially since coming out, have been they have they have been liberating. They have been transformative. They have been deeply mutual. I think is is another part of it, right? So not having to be the same, uh, but both uh, acknowledging, respecting, and revering each other's like journeys um, is a huge. It's been a huge factor um, to me in, in in the more positive relationships that I've that I've formed or evolved um, since since coming out. Yeah. And most importantly, it's been healing. Okay. <laughs> I mean, at least for me. Okay. Yeah. Ever since I got in alignment with my truth, it's just been healing. Yeah. And once you're healed, now you can live a rewarding life. Okay. A life that's rewarding, a life that's going to, you know, optimize you, that's going to compliment you, that's going to match the energy that you embody. And it's going to mirror the love you have for yourself no matter what form it is in. 100%. So I just thank you for sharing that. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll leave it. Is there anything more that you would like to share concerning your uh, relationships and, you know, your love for yourself and, and things like that? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think there's, there's so much of this pressure, especially now and with social media to to do self-care, um, mm -hmm. like to, to commit to self-love to the point where it really flattens what it is, mm -hmm. right? Because whether the love is turned inward or outward, it is a, a massive and challenging emotion. Uh, it is positive, it is healing, it is hopeful, it is all of these things, but it is not easy. Right. And so I think it's really important for folks to understand that and understand that it is a journey and it's a commitment that you you have to make to yourself. Um, I think as a part of, of growing, whether that means moving out, whether it means publicly transitioning, like there's such a spectrum of ways that we can take care of ourselves and make sure that we're growing in the ways that we need that feel, you know, that feel deeply nurturing. Um, but I, I want to advise against giving into that pressure of immediately loving yourself, mm. right? It's not a it's not a switch that you can flip. Mm. Uh, it takes time, and it is it's so gratifying. Um, you will move through the world infinitely better with more ease when you can come to terms with who you are and what and what you want, what you need. Mm. I agree uh, wholeheartedly. And if you you know, and and and. Let's look at monogamous as being monogamous to oneself. Okay. <laughs> Let's, don't let your first monogamous relationship be with somebody else. Okay. I know we talk that way and I know that's what we see in our household, great people. And that's why self-love is hard to obtain. Maintain and sustain is because love is looked outside of us, right? You ask somebody who their first love is, and they going back into high school and middle school. Oh, I think it was with John, or I think it was with little Kim. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm just being funny out there, unless it was with little Kim. But you get the point, great people. Your first love should be yourself, all right? Because at the end of the day, if, if that's your first love, and, and you commit to yourself, how you would like somebody to commit to you, you already defeated half the battle, okay? And yes, it is trying because now you have to redefine love, right? Yes. Well, you have to redefine these labels. You have to redefine masculinity. You got to redefine femininity. You got to redefine identity, okay? And then you got to redefine uh, even, your, even your own culture. I was raised in this culture. You even got to redefine what is home to you. Okay, home to me is in Atlanta, and I was born and raised in, in, in New Haven, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's my origin. That was my chosen home. That was the home that was given to me, right? That's on my birth certificate, but I feel at home here. Yeah. where I'm at now. So what is home to you? You have to redefine so many aspects and people don't want it. it some people are okay settling because working to do that internal work and healing is just too much. Right. It's too much. And it's really not too much because once you are in alignment with the God in you, okay, and you realize, you know what, I had this power the whole darn time. Right. When you tap into that type of magic, as I like to call it, you know, the sprinkle dust that uh, Tinkerbell put on Peter Pan. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> you know, you find yourself living in Never Ever Land. If you ask me, all right, all of a sudden you're flying, all right, and you're flying above the norms of living your life, the limitations that this society, the limitations and stipulations that society has put on you. So with that being said, great people, yeah. So, Jay, I'm going to talk, uh, let's, let's touch on something else. So when you said, um, just looking at my notes here, yeah. um, I want to go, I want to touch on the narrative of pain that you were talking about, right? That survival instinct that uh, Black people have in general, um, minorities of any population have in general, uh, uh, underprivileged populations. Talk about that. Like, you know, talk about how you were able to be now empower this resilience that you, you know, are experiencing in life that you're embodying? Yeah. Yeah. That's a big question. That's <laughs> a very big question. Um, you know, I, I, could, I still consider myself to be a person of faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and similar to what I was saying at the beginning of this conversation, I never expected to feel this powerful, period. Um, and that includes in terms of religion, divinity, spirituality, all of that was just like, I thought that it had to be at this level. And now I'm like up here and I'm like, okay, like this is where I want to be. Right. Um, and so a lot of it was, it was, it was framing, right. It was framing and, um, you know, again, indoctrination. So I, I through, especially through church, through Christian school, all that stuff, you know, the general messaging, especially in Christianity and different sects of Christianity, are that, you know, you actually, scarcity is holy. There's this idea that if you deprive yourself, uh, that that actually makes you closer to God, that if you deprive yourself, that you deserve more, you deserve to get in heaven. And again, as a person who has been deeply compassionate, uh, very sensitive, touchy-feely from an early age, the way that I felt I needed to survive, the way that I adapted was like, okay, like this is how I feel and how I want to move through the world. I guess I just got to sacrifice myself all the time. Uh, and so I would get to these points, right, where, you know, you imagine a fork in the road or an A, B, C decision. And consistently, I would be like, I'm going to choose the thing that requires me to give up the most. Um, and really equating that, like starting to wire myself, train myself to equate that decision making to being a good person, right? And so, you know, over time, it, it, it started out with things as simple as like, oh yeah, I'll give you my lunch, or oh yeah, I'll share my game with you, to becoming something a little more toxic and insidious in interpersonal relationships, where it was like, well, I did this thing for you the other time, and I didn't say that I expected something from you, but now I expect it from you. Um, you know, in the different ways that that manifest, that mentality manifested. Um, again, tying it back to this sense of like, I don't deserve anything. Um, fundamentally, that being the kind of truth that I was holding on to. And I honestly don't know if I would have gotten to this place without therapy, 100%. Um, I was in therapy for about three and a half years. Um, it was cognitive therapy, behavioral therapy, uh, CBT. Um, and we did a few other really important, like mindful and somatic type practices that helped me like embody the change that I was imagining and really like wanted uh, for myself to feel healthier. Um, but it, it took a lot. It took a lot of work. <laughs> it took multiple therapy sessions <laughs> once a week uh, for about an hour. Um, in addition to trying to implement all these teachings and these lessons in my day-to-day -day life for me to actually successfully start to think, actually, like, I do deserve more. I deserve everything. Everyone deserves everything. If we just accept this and we start to think about the world less than like a competitive zero-sum thing where it's like, if I have something, you don't have anything and vice versa, actually, we can all share abundance. Um, like this is the way that we can move through this world. Pain is inevitable, right? Like I don't want to pretend like we can achieve something where it's not happening, where conflict is completely erased. <clears throat> but the level of trauma, the level of grief, the real deep intergenerational 
pain that we are still moving through, not just as a people, but as a country, like just thinking in an American context. That is not necessary. Um, like there are a number of things that we can't be doing, this conversation being one of them, of course, but there's so much that we can be doing that ties into this, which is, again, really built on, is built on not just love, not just loving the people around you, but fundamentally loving yourself and believing that you deserve good things. You deserve to feel safe. You deserve to feel sustained. Um, you deserve to feel like you belong. Um, these are very fundamental, intrinsic human needs, which unfortunately are not a priority. They're not a priority in the workplace. They're clearly not a priority for our government in the way they see us as a population. Um, so again, there's like, there's the re there's the reality, right? There's a reality which you and I understand, oh, I think a lot of trans identifying people understand, even if we can't all articulate it the same way. And then there's the myth, which everyone else is still unfortunately buying into and trying to perpetuate in these different ways, right? Um, so I'll, I'll say it, it takes, it took a village. Like, I'm just gonna use that like turn of phrase, um, you know, cause I, again, I grew up, I grew up knowing I was loved by my family seeing the ways that they showed up for me, devoted themselves to my own growth um, and learning a lot from them. And then also seeing the ways that they cut themselves short um, or didn't have enough faith in an alternative, uh, whatever that may have looked like. And, and seeing it, seeing it myself as a part of that lineage of that ancestry and being like, we can do better. Like I can, I can do something different. I can do something better because I was given these experiences and because I have these realizations. Um, yeah, healing and transformation are slow. You know, it's not immediate, but it really, it really does come down to that, that fundamental, like that, that framing, the way that we talk to ourselves, right? The negative self, self-talk, positive self-talk, um, the narratives that we create to, to fit in, um, whatever that may look like, um, that I'm finding myself now, finally, like being able to confront uh, and change and shift. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I'm the same way. I'm, I'm like, it's all about the stories you tell yourself, right? And as youth, we were told these stories. <laughs> we believed those stories, even though spiritually they weren't um, sitting too well. But when you're taught fear and like you said this scarcity mindset you're scared to ask questions it's like well that doesn't make sense like no you don't you don't ask the pastor that or you don't mm -mm, we don't question and um it it's ah uh, it's um it's scary because I, I look at our youth now who are so they just have this different type of uh, way about them okay these gen z's okay <laughs> shout out to the gen z's for sure. Yeah, cause they're going to be the, the, you know, we got as millennials, but you got these Gen Z's out here, man. They, they, mm -hmm. they like, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. All yeah. uh, right. This is what you're going to call me today. Yeah. But um, <laughs> you mentioned safety and belongingness. And it kind of, it kind of triggered the um, experiences that our siblings go through that don't have that supportive, affirming um, environment, safe environment. Um, that they need to sustain. Um, and it reminds me of the Maslow hierarchy and how he discussed how shelter, food, and clothing are like your basic needs. This is the foundation that needs to be set in order to build, to have um, pretty much self-love. Uh, self yeah. And I, I think differently. I truly feel that you need belongingness, you need affirmation, you need love. Love is your foundation because if I don't have love, I'm gonna feel homeless anyway. I'm, if I'm not affirmed, I'm gonna feel homeless anyway. I don't care if I'm in a mansion, I don't care if I'm in a Bugatti, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna feel a certain level of self-worth that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna crave for a certain level of self-worth. And um, yeah, so tell us about your experience with therapy, like the affirming experiences that you are having. And, and I hope my mental health professionals have their pen and pad. Um, 
so they could take some notes, okay? Uh, <laughs> so can you discuss some of the affirming ways that your therapist was able to, um, you know, treat you, help guide you to your authentic being and becoming? A hundred percent. Um, you know, so I think a huge part of what gave me a good foundation in therapy was like, I think similar to you, I spent a lot of time in my head um, thinking about why I feel a type of way, what makes me feel bad, like all this kind of stuff. And I really had a, I had a, a good sense of where I wanted to be going um, when I started therapy back in, I guess it was 2019, 2018. Um, I think part of what really made part of the beautiful part, part of the beautiful, uh, aspects of, of, of my, my therapy experience was, you know, this kind of dual approach, right? So talking about the way that I was feeling and responding to cert certain situations or reacting to certain situations and identifying the structural systemic issues that were, that I was coming up against. Right. So it was never just like, oh, you feel bad. So this is your fault. It was you feel bad because this is the narrative that you've been telling yourself, because this is what capitalism tells us we need to want or the way that we need to move through the world. Um, and I think that that's just a huge it's a huge part of it. Um, when I think about what ineffective therapy looks like, which is, I think, the experience for a lot of people, unfortunately, um, it, it really comes down to this like hyper individualized um, kind of codependent model, right? Where you're showing up, you're complaining, they're giving you, you know, what they think you need and you're coming back. And that's just the cycle that you're, that you're doing over and over and over. Um, and I can, I can confidently say that was not my experience in therapy. And that's not to say there weren't some weeks where I was like, oh, like, what am I actually gonna talk about? Like, what do we have to talk through? Um, but it is to say that generally there was a feeling of shared like commitment to me, like getting well enough to not need therapy, um, at least temporarily. And, you know, those two things, I think, combine like the systemic and the interpersonal approach on top of like, this is a tool. I'm giving you tools, which I am going to help you learn how to use and eventually you can use autonomously with other people within yourself to move through these moments, which have caused you deep stress, trauma, depression, like all the, you know, all the things that can come from um, a malnourished, emotional, psychological, spiritual self. Um, so those are, those are huge, huge parts of what I think made my, my therapy experience as positive as it was. Yeah. And I like that, that you mentioned that because a lot of therapists, I, I don't want to say a lot, but there are some who take this diagnostic approach uh -huh. and it eliminates the healing that needs to be occurring because, uh, my, my thing is as a leader, as an educator, as a healer mm -hmm. that I am, I don't, <laughs> I don't want you to depend on me. I, I have the mindset where I need to teach you how to fish. I need to heal you so you could be self-sufficient. So, you can take those tools, like you said, take your toolbox and be able to help somebody else heal, mm -hmm. you know, and that's part of that's part of me being an effective healer or an effective leader or an effective service uh, and, and being, you know, providing quality service because the quality service I provide is adding to the quality of life that you deserve to experience. And you're not a providing a quality service if, if the quality of life is still the same three years of being in, in your service. I mean, because <laughs> some people have in-depth trauma where it does take a lot of time. And there's, you know, even time in itself is a is an indoctrinated type of philosophy, but we ain't gonna go there on this platform. Um, so <laughs> uh, just it, taking what you need. And I remember it was hard for me to go to therapy because I was just so used to keeping certain doors locked. Yes. meaning not communicating those, you know, that's just something I'm not going to communicate. I know you're a professional, but um, I just want to know why. And it wasn't even why me, it was why is the society so effed up? You know, <laughs> can we talk about that? Mm -hmm. So I could feel affirmed because, <laughs> yeah. And I can't imagine because we have some of our siblings who 
especially our trans sisters, our, our sisters out here who are going through a lot and our, our brothers out here who are going through a lot, our trans brothers. And, you know, suicide is so high. Yes. Murder is so high, you know, and, and it's scary because you live in this fight or flight way of being and our systems naturally, our innate being is not created that way. So mm-hmm. when you're constantly living in a state of a shock, fear, and, you know, got to look over your shoulder. And even when you're transitioning into, into this new way of becoming, you're also transitioning safety zones, right? When I was identifying as a female, it was okay for me to ride in the car and not fear being pulled over by the police um you know and 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 same goes for our sisters uh when now they want to express their authenticity and they got to look over their back because you know they don't know if they're going to get jumped or Mm -hmm. humiliated or you know violated sexually and then physically i mean it's just a it's just it's just a nightmare so Mm -hmm. Can you touch on, you know, as an advocate, right? Because that's, that's who we are in this society. You know, as an advocate, can you touch on some of the concerns that you have when it comes to um, our sisters and our brothers? Yeah. Where do I start? Okay. I don't okay. know. Should we start at one or should we start at A? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I... I feel like for a lot of, a lot of us, um, there is, there is a a kind of, again, there is like a pro and a con, it's a paradox, Um, especially for, for trans folks who do identify in the binary. There's like this, this feeling of, of metamorphosis that you get to, to go through and to feel good about uh, in terms of embodying the person who you who you feel you are, who you're meant to be. Um, and simultaneously, you get to come up against what we've been talking about, which is people thinking that that then gives them license to violate you, to harm you. Um, I feel like, at least for me, there's so much of this conversation. So there's like, there's the, there's a real physical element, right? Where we're like going about our days, all the stress and anxiety is not healthy. Um, And so we need ways to manage that, whether it's in a support group, a healing circle, therapy, whatever that may look like, that need that, you know, that foundation, um, that sharing space where we can talk about what we're going through and how we can move through it. And then there's also like, there's a a self-defense element of it, um, which I think is increasingly important. and to me is tied to a feeling of self-worth and self-love. It's like, if you are going to come at me, I'm going to protect myself. Um, And that's not always gonna be a physical altercation, but we're gonna have a conflict, um, right? Because I'm just here existing and you're out here trying to disrespect me. And that's unacceptable um, on a human to human level, right? So that's, that's an increasing part of what I feel is very important is for trans people not only to be able to cultivate that mental safety, that emotional security or self-defense, but also the physical self-defense. Because unfortunately, I don't think, I'm a type of person who for a long time, I felt very diplomatic in my approaches, right? I'm like, we'll just have a conversation. Like we can just talk about this. And sure, that can be the case with some people. That is definitely the case, I think, with with those that we know and love and trust and are in our circles. Um, But that's not always the energy, um, especially with strangers. And so I really feel like we need to be having deeper conversations about security. And again, and not just being about like, I'm ready to put up hands, but like, how am I actually protecting myself and allowing myself to explore these possibilities, challenge myself and grow in these ways where I'm not being suffocated by fear, where I'm not leaving my house, right? Which is something I've, I've done, right? Like, let's be real, yeah. between the pandemic and transitioning, like, I'm like, I'm actually just not going to go anywhere. 
Um, okay. Because that is that is what feels safe to me right now, you know. But I again, I, I, I'm I am hopeful. I am believing. I am choosing to put put stock in um, this idea that we we don't need to operate that way. That shouldn't be the norm. That shouldn't be the default. Mm. Um, and so I think that there, there needs to be a, a more holistic conversation that we're having around not only how we can protect ourselves, right, individually, but how we can protect each other. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, I know that like community care is like our bread and butter. It's been the way that we've survived for the last several centuries um, in this context, in this country. Um, but there's, I think there's a little bit more of a, of a I think there's a more of an expansive thinking um, that, that, or expansive conversation that we should be having um, around the way that all of these kinds of, these feelings of safety uh, tie into each other and how we can like help cultivate them together. I, I love that safety approach. And you know what, what <laughs> having that holistic approach, and I sometimes, and, and, and please share, share your, your perspective, that people live in fear, like, some, I wonder if people live in fear to be associated with us outside of our familial construct. So it's like, you know, yeah, you know, all right, that's cool, but I don't want no parts of it because if I'm associated with you, then now I'm putting myself at risk. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about safety, that's what kind of, you know, has me just thinking about it, trying to think about it on another, on another level. Yeah. And that's where these expansive conversations come in because it's like, you know, what, what really is the issue? The deep rooted seed that has been implemented and bordered this whole time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that seed of fear. So it's like how individuals were um, living in fear, helping out uh, black people to become free. Right. It was, they, they were being, you know, abused too. <laughs> so when it comes to us, it's like, if I'm associated with you, then where does that put me? Mm -hmm. um, and, and what does that look like for me? Mm -hmm. And it's a reasonable question in a conversation, like you said, you know, we need to learn how to help each other in a way that is safe uh, and healthy for us. What does that look like? What is helping each other look like uh, through a, a safety lens, through a holistic lens, through a lens that we're not living in fear, if fear didn't exist, what would that look like? What would our relationships look like? You know, what would our politics, okay, look like? Um, <laughs> speaking of the P word, <laughs> mm -hmm. the almighty mighties, okay? Um, <laughs> what, how do you express some of your concerns? I mean, because you don't even know how to ask a question with these politics, really, because I'm honestly, I, you know, spirituality is so significant to me it's really hard for me to talk about politics because i've learned in my transition to transition from mm. to detransition from the political ways of operating my life mm -hmm. and you know my politics come from spirit they come from sources that are higher than uh the ones passing congress so mm -hmm. me personally i have embodied this godly way of being this confidence that i like to say right i've i've been in alignment with the gifts that i obtain i've um you know am building a relationship with my genius i'm taking my omnipotence and i'm being dominant in my life and that dominion and discipleship that i obtain the confidence i exercise is allowing me to just let go and let god okay so when it comes to surgeries or healthcare, is it something that's on my mind? And um, no, because I, you know, my, my, I'm working with my healer. He's going to put me across individuals who are going to, you know, who he can work through and who mm -hmm. are going to affirm me in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be so traumatic when I'm having to navigate certain experiences in healthcare or so when it comes to politics, I share that because it's, it's not at my forefront. That's why I like taking, like you said, a holistic approach, because I know that's more empowering. And that's um, more changing. That's more of a game changer than me saying, okay, the po politics, because at the end of the day, they're, they're people like us. Okay. <laughs> people yeah. like us and it's hard for them to see through they got to be more careful so how do you feel about what did you know express some of your concerns on this platform because this is a safe place for us to do so 
-hmm. when it comes to politics, laws being passed in regards to our community, transgender non-conforming? Mm -hmm. Yeah, God, I love these questions. They're just <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so you think about, you know, when we were talking about this feeling of imprisonment and the way that that is, um, that that is a, an apt analog for uh, gender conformity uh, or sexual conformity. Um, I think about the, a similar binary, um, which we have in the United States, right? We have a two party system effectively. Mm. Um, and while the parties do operate differently, they're both governed by the almighty dollar. Mm. And, you know, there is, I feel like, unfortunately, the mainstream narrative is something that you were touching on. And, and there's this sense that if your politics do not directly align to what the Democratic or Republican platform is, then it's almost kind of invalidated or people don't really know where to meet you. Um, but for me, I'm definitely, I feel like I'm very aligned with you and that I start with people. I'm like, how, what do people need to feel good? What do people need to feel like their full selves? Uh, and a lot of that does connect to material needs. It does connect to the Maslow hierarchy, right? So making sure you have food, you have housing, um, these things that are fundamental to the human experience, but we have managed over decades, over centuries to put a literal price tag on. We have managed to cut people off. We punish people for being poor. We punish people for being unhoused. That's wild. If you look at that and you say that this is a political system that is functioning, you are out of your mind. Uh, it's, it's, you, you can't, you can't look at the material conditions. You can't look at the level of suffering that we are allowing to happen, that our political leadership is allowing to happen and say that this is okay, right? And again, the, like in part, thanks to the pandemic, I think a lot of people are waking up to that uh, and realizing that this is not okay and that we need to be doing things differently. Um, but, you know, a lot of my, I would say the, the, the core of my politics are, are focused on collective liberation and mm -hmm. radical love. Um, and when I use those words, what I mean by collective liberation is an understanding that despite the fact that we all move through this world in varying identities, varying experiences, we are still interconnected. And it is important to be thinking about the people who can move through the world easily and those who move through it with the most challenge in the mm -hmm. way that we can make, the, make that differentiation as small as possible. Um, when I talk about radical love, like that is deeply tied to my faith. Um, that, is, that is how I've managed to recontextualize and reclaim my connection to religion. Because for a minute there, like from 12 years old to like 25 years old, I was out here being like, I don't, I don't believe in anything, um, right? And that coming from that place of, of cynicism and that place of, oh, I don't belong anywhere. I can't be my full self. Uh, the book says so, right? Um, and so that, that that recontextualizing of what radical love means. It doesn't just mean the kumbaya, right? Like immediately arriving at the destination of peace because that is also completely unrealistic uh, and a result of magical myths uh, that, that this country has, has created for us um, and exported through the world, unfortunately. Um, you know, so when, I, when I'm talking about radical love, I'm talking about what it means to move through conflict lovingly to move through difficult times and say you know while i am struggling in this way i actually do have this thing which can help you i can offer this to you or um you know i think about mutual aid constantly which is another thing that is core to our community um and how it is so different from the majority charity kind of driven uh help or support um, that is often championed by political leadership um, and creates the systems of, of codependency and dependency that we're talking about when we're talking about therapy. Like you can see the way, you can see the way that all of these tie into a really not good ideology, mm. frankly, um, one that is only interested in maintaining a status quo, mm. one that is only interested in profiting um, and things that are just not going to create something that's sustainable 
something that is that feels good for everyone or as many people as possible. Um, and so there's a part of that, which is for me also a politics of pleasure. Um, I see my my belief in radical love as a, a translation of a politics of pleasure, which is that like, I deserve to feel good. Everyone deserves to feel good. What can we do to feel good? Um, it shouldn't be, oh, I need to be working 10 hours a day so that I can barely make my rent so that I can hopefully get my kids new clothes for school. Like that is, that should not be where the decision-making is for people. That is such a, a depressing reality that we continue to live in. Um, you know, and beyond that, I, 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 I said this before, like as a part of liberation, as a part of love, I'm like, we all deserve abundance and it's possible. It is, you know, it's wild. It's wild that there are companies out here making billions of dollars when we could literally, we could solve homelessness, mm -hmm. we could solve poverty with a fraction of a company's yearly revenue. Mm -hmm. What are we doing? What are we doing? Not enough, is what okay. I can say, right? You're um, really doing the minimum, okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, you know, so that's, I, I really appreciate you you talking about, you know, the, the difficulty in framing these conversations as political because i'm i'm actually uh i'm reading a book right now um called how we get free by mm -hmm. kiana taylor um and it's essentially a retrospective and anthology on black feminist thought um and the fact is it's like we're out here now doing what we need to do and trying to to help as many people as we can but like they were doing that 40 50 years ago Mm. talking about things that we're still trying to implement now um and just recognizing that you know and there's a sadness in that right that we haven't moved that far ahead but there's also a hope in it um because it does feel like these concepts are becoming more and more popular um they are entering the mainstream consciousness in a way that our masters are okay around the majority do not want they're like wait a minute mm -hmm. <laughs> you should be asking for this right. um you know and that's why i say you know this is more of a spiritual war because if you're not in alignment with your spiritual being then um these downloads or this sense uh you know the, the aura of your essence is is always going to be confined um and you know people would ask you know who are you voting for myself Okay, that, that, that's what I'm voting for. All right. I'm voting for myself. All right. It's in, in, and I know people might feel, you know, some type of way, but it comes with that radical love. You know, when I go and vote and I don't see uh, an individual who truly represents me and who I feel truly 100% represents me and who cares about me. Um, yeah, no, I'm putting my name on the box. I know y'all ain't seen me on the news or anything like that, but you know, that's, that's just what. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I have to be my own government. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not my own government, then um, it's, it's like loving yourself. If I don't love me, then it is selfish of me to some extent to make you responsible for loving me. Mm -hmm. I have to take care of my well-being. I can't give my well-being and my power uh, to this government that is constantly... Uh, like you say, making a profit, making a profit. Not only are you making a profit, you ain't giving nobody no raises. Mm -hmm. Okay. I should get a raise. I should get a vote in tax. Uh, I should get a vote in tax stipend. Okay. You want me to vote? Pay me. Okay. How am I voting for you? And then I got to pay you through taxes after, mm -hmm. you know, listen. Mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, I got to struggle to, like you said, put put sneakers on my child and be punished for being poor because now my kids got to go to school and, it, and clothes that I can only afford um, or, or hand me downs, you know, if I can't afford any. Um, and they be punished for being poor. They be picked, you know, bullied and picked on because, you know, this is just this system that is being made. And you can see the domino effects of it. Exactly. And when this isn't, when this reality is not their reality every day, it's not a problem. You know, I, I don't see nothing wrong with it. Of course, you don't see nothing wrong with it because everything you driving and, and walking into is 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 glitzing. Gl it, it, you you straight, okay. <laughs> and but at the same time, it is the poor that is upholding this uh this government. Yeah. You know, um, 
So if we take this holistic approach and people are conscious and they're spiritually woke, now you have an issue that you that 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 you can't now now you have a war that hum, that that this political government can't be. You know, because now you can't kill my spirit because guess what? You could kill this body, you know, flesh can go, but I'm going to transcend. Yes. Why? Because that's what my spirit is. My spirit is energy. Energy transforms. Energy transcends. Energy evolves. So you technically can't kill me. That's why Jesus resurrected. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I, you know, don't get me going on this platform. Right. Not enough time. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna need the politicians to wake up, and if you can, at least uh, crack the door open so we can slither in and mm-hmm. make some changes. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, and here's another. I mean, for, uh, not not forget about the political government, but let's take off of that. Uh, let's approach the stigmatization that we experience in our own community. Okay, when it comes to trans masculine and trans feminine folks like us trying to be leaders and uh, find and put, you know, you, you have these LGBT organizations, great people. Okay. And there's a reason why all these letters is in the group. Okay. I'm trying to figure out why aren't all these letters having a face in the group, all right? I'm just seeing lesbians and gays, and they don't care about us trans folk. I'm just putting it out there. Y'all can say y'all care. I mean, there's some folks that care, okay? But, you know, the transgender community, we, we're like the Gullah Gullah Island, okay? We're just out here. <laughs> I think, I, I, you know, and I, and, I, and I express this on this platform, and if people feel some kind of way, then that, that that's just on you. But we were... Transgender non-conforming individuals, we're being mixed up with the LGB community mm-hmm. because we're part of the weird folk. Okay, mm-hmm. so let's just throw them on up in there. Mm-hmm. But we're really not, when you're talking about sex and gender, it's um it's it's different. We're 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 changing our gender. So it really frustrates me when I mm-hmm. hear about these LGB organizations and hearing about uh lesbian and and gay individuals being certified inclusive or DEI inclusive and they're giving education on my life. You don't have the, you know what? I'm just let you speak because I'm, I'm starting to sweat. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't be sweating on this platform. I'm wearing pink. I'm wearing pink. <laughs> I'm out here wearing purple. Like, yeah, That's right. Okay. It's the spirit coming through us. Yeah. Right we have to address these issues because we're also facing um isolation and neglect in our own community yeah you know at i just recently uh applied for a director's position right and i and and i didn't want to do it because i'm an entrepreneurial spirit but because it was an educational position i I put in for i was actually offered to apply Mm -hmm. but as the process continues okay (laughs) my spiritual enlightenment because that's what also happens when spiritual folks you get cues that uh people think that you don't have okay but you know anyway my enlightenment educated me informed me um, that this was an unfair process. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was due to people you know, because we know that's how the world operates, is who you know and what you know. Now, I am a PhD candidate, okay? PhD to the level where I'm not just starting my program. I've completed the coursework and in my dissertation process, okay? Mm-hmm. I have two masters and two bachelors. And I'm not here to brag, but I'm talking about the qualifications that I have according to the societal yeah. way of operating. And I worked hard for that, okay? <laughs> so when I got the email, okay, <laughs> saying that uh, the, the opportunity has been given to someone else, but now they're trying to offer me this consult, this consultant opportunity. Mm. And, and I'm reading this contract and I'm like, okay, I don't know how the director gonna supervise anything. What are their credentials? Okay. <laughs> Who's that? And I'm just like, I hate it when you put in your job description BIPOC and, you know, we encourage BIPOC populations, transgender non-conforming individuals to apply just for you to reject us. Uh, You know, wake up, great people. All right. If you want anything concerning the transgender population, hire a a representative of that population 
please and thank you. I am not going to go and teach about, um, you know, gay rights and, and, and lesbian rights. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did uh, navigate my life at one time identifying as lesbian, but that was because I thought in, in, in my understanding, in my community, I felt like that is how I can identify because I like women. And my sexual preference was if you like women and you're assigned female at birth and you're lesbian. Mm -hmm. That ain't had nothing to do with my identity when it came to gender. Gender, I wanted to be male, period. You okay. know, and even in my transcending and in my transition and in me transforming today, I'm now learning to detach myself from male, female. Listen, I'm just me. You want to know my pronouns? Me, myself, and I. Please and thank you. And if you can't fit that in your sentence uh, in a proper way, you could call me Dr. Scholar Lee. Bryson, Scholar, whichever uh, suits you, you, tickles your fancy. All right? <laughs> but let's talk about that. I don't want on a tangent. So how do you express your concerns when it comes to our family, our household? Sometimes you got to clean what's in your house before you even attack the politics. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, it, um, <laughs> you know, another, another, I'm, I'm leaning on the ancestors. I'm leaning on our lineage right now because I, I had a very, I had an enlightening, a spiritual experience, um, you know, reading and listening to James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time uh, about a month ago. And this conversation is, is, is bringing that to the forefront for me uh, because it reminds me that there are multiple, there are multiple avenues of black political thought, right? So there's like, there's a, there's this important distinction that we need to be making. And this goes for all marginalized identities, multiply marginalized folks, folks who are racial or class like marginalized. We need to be talking about things in such a more expansive way. Um, there is a school of thought where we were expected to assimilate and to integrate. Um, and of course, that is how a lot of us are still here, right? Mm -hmm. that, that was a survival strategy and it worked mm -hmm. um, because we're still here. Right. But that is not the same as getting free, which is what mm -hmm. I am invested in. That is not the same as experiencing a natural state of joy, of pleasure, of self-sufficiency. Those are different things. And so my fear, especially as trans and gender expansive folks continue to become more visible, is that we are going to start leading into the same trap, uh, right? And we see this between the decades of Martin and Malcolm and many, many other powerful leaders uh, during that period to the Obama years where he was in the White House for eight years, what fundamentally changed? Mm. Nothing, right? And, and this is, again, a part of this is, it goes deeper than politics, it's cultural, where we have these hero myths that we really, really want to believe in, and we select or elect people to embody these things when they're not beholden to us. They do not care. Or they feel like they have their hands tied. There are a number of, of excuses and reasonings that people can come up with in positions of power to say, actually, I can't do anything, right? And so to me, that, that reminds me of how important it is for us to not just be taking care of each other, making sure that we're getting our, our needs met, but also making sure that we all feel like we can advocate and or be leaders in our own right. Because mm -hmm. every leader does not need to look the same. Mm -hmm. I, started, I started organizing in college. It's been almost 10 years now. I started after Trayvon was murdered, right? Mm -hmm. And at that point I was like, all right, I gotta be out in these streets. Mm -hmm. Everything is about direct action and protests. Maybe we can get some people in office to write some bills to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And that was way, way back when. I'm on a completely different tip. No, I know that's right. right? And I, I, I am hoping that the people, the people who are in our community, the people who are trans identifying, and, and hoping that you know elected leadership is going to save them, come to terms with the fact that that's not the way that this works. Mm -hmm. People people tend to forget that the civil rights bill actually was only passed because people were out here in violent confrontation with cops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> out here, um, 
out here fasting, out mm-hmm. here going on hunger strikes, mm. uh, not working, not showing up to work, telling their bosses, I'm not doing this today mm. because I am a second class citizen in a country I helped build. Mm. I mean, like there, there are so many, there's a spectrum mm. of action, of political action and political ideology that we can be participating in. And I really just, I want folks to, to recognize that, right? It's not, it's not key to me. I believe in coalition building, right? So whatever part of the struggle feels most intimate and important to you, that's where you should be coming through, right? Like what you were saying, you're not going to be talking for people who are gay or lesbian because that's not you. That's not your experience. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is important that people recognize their experiences and come into this moment, come into the movement um, with that understanding so that they can say, hey, actually, I'm going to focus my resources, my time, my energy, my dollars, whatever, on this thing because this is actually what's going to facilitate change. Again, Mm -hmm. it's not going to be immediate. Transformation Mm -hmm. is slow. Healing is slow, like I said. But these are the questions and the answers that we need to be pushing each other towards. Because like I said, like, I'll say this. I love Pose. I love (laughs) what the show has done for our community, especially our trans sisters and our trans siblings. Um, But it does scare me, right, that now we're at this point where you have mass, expensive entertainment media being produced that is focusing on us and our truths Mm. and saying, that's what I want to do. I'll aspire to do that. Mm. Fundamentally, it's not necessarily going to change anything. Mm -hmm. It's not going to save the little Black trans girl, you know, who comes from a poor family. Mm Mm-hmm doesn't even have internet who you know just wants to be her full self yeah who can't afford netflix okay (laughs) there's there's an importance again i want to i want to reiterate there's an importance to visibility it's important for us to see people who look like us so that we know that we deserve to be here and that we can in fact exist exactly but it is not a liberatory strategy it will, mm-hmm. tie, it will feed right back into the system where you're out here getting coin for yourself and you are only taking care of the people directly connected to you. And that's, and that's just insufficient. Mm-hmm. insufficient. And it, it goes back to another reason why spirituality is so significant that we'll start wrapping this up because I know you got, you got, you know, your life. But what spiritual contract did you sign? Mm-hmm. When it came to my purpose and living my truth, that was the first contract I had to sign. And yes, it was scary because living my truth came with some fears, right? Because we think about Martin Luther King, man, he, he spoke up and now he's gone. Uh, we think about, you know, Jesus. Well, geez, they crucified him. So what is my truth? Where is that going to lead me? But when you obtain this certain fearlessness about yourself, like, listen, You could kill me, but you can't kill my legacy. You can't stop my voice from being heard. These people, uh, you know, our ancestors have, you know, ascended and they're still being um, respected. Okay. So when it comes to that, I had to personally sign in my purpose to sign a spiritual contract. And I say this because I was watching the first lady uh, show, right? (laughs) Mm-hmm. And they touched on the gay, uh, the uh, gay people, gay and lesbians uh, getting married and how uh, President Obama had, uh, you know, had some uh, c- conflict about it, because if he approved it, then the religion sponsors or whatever party, whatever, uh you know, it was just going to be some issues with that. Yeah, so man. when I talk about your spiritual, my spiritual contract, I made an agreement that I cannot allow for certain factors like that take place when it comes to giving voice and saving lives. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you know, it's just um, a human um, response to care for one person. Love feels good. You know, it feels so good. It feels so good to be like, to hear somebody say, you know what, you empowered me, or that was so nice, or you saved my life, or when I heard this, man, I felt so affirmed. That's more rewarding to me than me looking at my bank account, uh, seeing a million dollars. Okay, I have a million dollar spirit. I have a billion. I have an infinite spirit. First of all, you can't even put a price on that. You can't afford me. But we can talk money. Okay, (laughs) brother got to get paid for his gifts. 
<laughs> but please do know this is a spiritual contract that you are in, or you you about the experience so don't come at me devaluing my experience and devaluing my um my essence devaluing my being we, we ain't gonna do that because i worked too hard i cried too many nights i overcame too many fears um and and like i said you know trans to me has nothing to do with being associated with being a minority trans is being triumphant over life's obstacles resilient against adversity and becoming an authentic noble success so if you want to experience any of this okay uh, you need to get your uh, bank account straight since that's what you live your life by, all right? And that's all I'm saying, because at the end of the day, I'm not living off of your government. I'm living off of my ancestors. I'm living off of my angels. I'm living off of my spiritual blessings, yes. okay? You are dealing with a, um, a spiritually enriched being. So I'm always be straight. I ain't going hungry over here on these streets. And that's what the holistic approach looks like. It looks like this, okay? It looks like me and Jay, great people. All right, so <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna say that. So, man, this is such. I mean, this conversation could go on for decades. All right, but uh, <laughs> we don't want to give them too much, Jay, because they got to digest this wealth of information. All right, we ain't trying to overdose them. So, with that being said, I like to la I like to ask these last three questions. What advice uh, would you like to give? What empowering advice would you like to give to our siblings, our transgender nonconforming community, so they could continue to be trans in the empowering way in which I explain? It's so hard to answer this question and not have it feel like, you know, a cop out or just like a blanket statement. Mm -hmm. What I would say is, however you feel, whether it be good or bad or in between, know that that is valid. Mm -hmm. Know that you deserve to feel that way. And beyond that, you deserve absolute safety, no matter where you are, no matter how much money you make or how little money you make, you deserve an existence where you do not need to worry about someone attacking you, someone taking your home away from you. You deserve so much more than that. And, and what advice would you like to give, uh, you know, our family members to best affirm our identities? We move yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, for for families, for for parents, for guardians. What I would say is, even if you don't understand the experience of your of your gender nonconforming, gender expansive uh, uh, family member or child, um, know that we all move through this world growing. Mm. The growth does not stop once we achieve a certain job or achieve parenthood. It keeps going. And the people around you, uh, the trans people in your life, actually can help you uh, become and see so much more than you have previously. So, so try and stay open to that opportunity because the possibilities are really, they're infinite. We can be so much more together uh, through learning with each other. Yes, yes. And what advice do you want to give our professionals, um, politicians, okay? What advice would you like to give them so they could best affirm our identities as well? Listen to us. <laughs> it shouldn't be that hard. Okay. <laughs> we, know, we know what we need and, and you need to give it to us, um, right? Mm -hmm. And with that being said, great people, okay. <laughs> Jay, you are such an honor to have on this platform. Um, I truly hope to have you again. And great people, you know what I say. Continue to be great, be bold, and always, always, always be you. Dr. Scholar Lee signing off. Peace. You are interested in making a donation to the Dr. Scholar Lee Experience podcast, you can send donations to Cash App, which is dollar sign Dr. Scholar Lee. 
PayPal, which is at Dr. Scholar Lee, and or you can use the email for PayPal and Zelle, which is info at drscholarlee.com. I thank you so much in advance.